Welcome to the Book of Mormon. This is Dr. D. Todd Harrison, your instructor today, as we continue to feast upon the words of Jesus Christ through the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. This year we are focused uh, in the church on the Book of Mormon. Uh, next year will be the Doctrine and Covenants. The following year will be the Old Testament and the New Testament as we devote one whole year to each of the four standard works of the Gospel. And so we're having a great time in studying the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. And I want to bear my testimony that Jesus is the Christ, that he rose from the dead, that God vindicated him through raising him from the dead. He is our Lord, and he is our God, and he is our Savior of this world. And I testify that if we will humble ourselves before him, repent of our sins, keep his commandments, he will always embrace us into his, uh, into his arms and bless us with peace and joy and happiness in this life and eternal life in the world to come. Which means that no eye has seen nor ear heard what wonderful great things God has prepared for those who love him and to keep his commandments. I testify that these things are true. As we, and I want to welcome you all aboard uh, this week as we spend time in the Word of God. And I testify that He loves you. He, he loves that you're here ready to open your hearts to Him, to have the Spirit speak to your hearts what you need to do at this time in your lives. And I also love you. I thank you for spending your time with us. And I'm just really grateful that you're joining us this week. We will look this week at the Mosiah. Chapters 11 through 17. And this is the great story about the uh, prophet. And the uh, prophet Ab Abinadi. Who was a great mighty prophet upon the earth. And he spoke with boldness and with power and authority. And not as the scribes and Pharisees as Jesus would say. And he converted the, the uh, future prophet Alma. Who will go forward and change his life. And and be the means of baptizing and converting many uh, to the gospel for many years the rest of his life and uh, raise up uh, uh, Alma the Younger that we'll read about later on in the Book of Mormon who in turn will do his part in, further in uh, furthering the work of the Lord upon the earth. And so in uh, chapter 11 it talks about King Noah and how King Noah now has become the king uh, after his, his father Zenith had appointed the kingdom upon his head. But King Noah was a wicked man and did not walk after the statues and after the commandments in the way that his father kept the commandments. And he appointed his own priests. He appointed his own priests. He took many wives and concubines and had the priests take many wives and concubines. And they had taxed the people quite heavily, a full 20% of all their taxes, to build a uh, gold and uh, the precious ornamental uh, seats so that they had these great seats that the people could look upon them and sitting in gold and all kinds of precious uh, gemstones and they uh, m made it in such a way that they could lie down and be lazy and as they sp spoke flattery words to the people. How do you gain popularity in this world? Well you speak the, the flattery words to them. You speak to them the things that they want to hear. You don't speak the commandments of God. You don't speak repentance or, or command them to repent in the name of the Lord. And this is what Alma, this is what you know, King Noah and his and his uh, priests were doing. Well, we'll now look at uh, verse twenty in chapter eleven. He says here, and it came to pass that there was a man among them whose name was Abinadi, and he went forth among them and began to prophesy, saying. Not words of flattery, but the words of God. Watch this. Behold, thus saith the Lord, and thus hath he commanded me, saying, Go forth and say unto this people, Thus saith the Lord, Woe be unto this people, for I have seen their abominations, and their wickedness, and their whoredoms, and except they repent, I will visit them in my anger. And except they repent, and turn to the Lord their God, behold, I will deliver them into their hands of their enemies. Yea, and they shall be brought into bondage, and they shall be afflicted by the hands of their enemies. And it shall come to pass that they shall know that I am the Lord their God, and am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of my people. 
And it shall come to pass that except his people repent and return unto the Lord their God, they shall be brought into bondage, and none shall deliver them except it be the Lord the Almighty God. And so we see this throughout the scriptures, that God will continue to deliver the people into in to the hands of their enemies if they will reject him from their lives and fail to keep his commandments. And the reason he does this is to give them that second opportunity to repent of their sins, to come unto him, and then he will always rescue them from their enemies. We see this throughout the Bible. We see this throughout the Book of Mormon. Now we will look here at uh, verse 24. He says, uh, Yea, and it shall come to pass that when they shall cry unto me, I will be slow to hear their cries. Yea, and I will suffer them that they shall be smitten by their enemies. So here God says that when he's disciplining his, his people, uh, he will be slow to hear their cries. If he answered their cries right away to rescue them every time they got into trouble, how much quicker they're just going to go back into forsaking him and not keeping the commandments. So he wants to make sure it's a sincerity of heart, a true turning to him, a true repentance. Then by that slow turning, God will slowly turn the wrath away from them as they d develop sincerity of heart and not just say magical words that they're repenting of their sins. In verse 25, Except they repent in sackcloth and ashes and cry mightily to the Lord their God, I will not hear their prayers. It has to be sincere. Neither will I deliver them out of their afflictions. And thus saith the Lord, and thus hath he commanded me. Now it came to pass that when Abinadi had spoken these words unto them, they were wroth with him. Yeah, because they were not the flattery words, the things that the people were wanting to hear and that the priests of Noah were teaching the people. And they were wroth with him, sought to take away his life, but the Lord delivered him out of their hands. Now we're not told how this happened, if he disappeared like Jesus did in the Gospels after he was spoken the synagogue in Capernaum. Or, or how this took place, but just says the Lord delivered him out of their hands, and so now Abinadi is you know angry about this. He you know wants to kill him. Uh, they go to, uh, to find him, and they can't find him. And now in uh, verse in chapter twelve, we'll look at one through eight. It says, and it came to pass that after the space of two years. So what had happened here? God gave him two years to. Remember the things that Abinadi had spoken to them, the threats and the warnings from God that Abinadi had prophesied unto them, to give them a chance to entertain these thoughts, a chance to repent of their sins so that God would not have to destroy them. So after two years he said Abinadi again, in disguise, that they knew him not, and he began to prophesy among them, saying, Thus hath the Lord commanded me, saying, Abinadi, go and prophesy unto this my people, for they have hardened their hearts against my words. They have repented not of their evil doings. Therefore I will visit them in my anger. He's the second chance God. He's given them another opportunity. Uh, yea, in my fierce anger will I visit them in their iniquities and abominations. Yea, woe unto this generation. And the Lord saith unto me, Stretch forth thy hand and prophesy, saying, Thus saith the Lord, it shall come to pass that this generation, because of their iniquity, shall be brought into bondage, and shall be smitten on the cheek. Yea, and shall be driven by man, and shall be slain, and the vultures of the air and of the dogs. Yea, and the wild beasts shall devour their flesh. And it shall come to pass that the life of King Noah shall be valued even as a garment in a hot furnace. For he shall know that I am the Lord. And it shall come to pass that I will smite this my people with sore afflictions, yea, with famine, and with pestilence, and I will cause that they shall howl all the day long. Yea, and I will cause that they shall have burdens lashed upon their backs, and they shall be driven before like a dumb ass as they get caught into, a, brought into captivity, into slavery. And it shall come to pass that I will send forth hail among them, and it shall smite them, and they shall also be smitten with the east wind. And the insects shall pester their land also, and devour their grain. And they shall be smitten with a great pestilence. And all this will I do because of their iniquities and abominations. And it shall come to pass that except they repent, I will utterly destroy them from off the face of the earth. Yea, they shall leave a record behind them. And I will preserve them for other nations which shall possess this land. 
So he's going to destroy the people uh, throughout the history of the world. He wants them to leave records of God's having done this. Uh, otherwise, it's not a good example and a lesson to other people not to repeat the same behavior of that fallen nation. This would do, discovered abominations of this people to other nations and many things that Abinadi, uh, did Abinadi prophesy against this people. So now, of course, what's going to happen? They're going to be more angry once again with Abinadi and try to capture him, bring him before the king. And now Abinadi said unto them, verse 25, after he's been captured here. Now Abinadi said unto them, Are ye priests and pretend to teach this people and to understand the spirit of prophesying and yet desire to know me what these things mean? They started asking him about, first they were trying to catch him in, in words so they could use uh, them against him to uh, pro prosecute and, and kill him. And uh, when he confounded them uh, in their... Um, uh, here in verse 19, and they began to question him that they might cross him, that they might thereby have wherewith to accuse him. But he answered them boldly and withstood all their questions, yea, to their astonishment. For he did withstand them in all their questions and did confound them in all their words. And then they started to ask him about scriptures. And so Abinadi here says, And now Abinadi said unto them, Are you priests and pretend to teach this people and to understand the spirit of prophesying? and yet desire to know me what these things mean? I say unto you, woe be unto you for perverting the ways of the Lord. For if ye understood these things, ye have not taught them. Therefore ye have perverted the ways of the Lord. Uh, we've talked about this before. You know, uh, that uh, you know, true pastors, true teachers, true leaders of God should understand the scriptures. They should be able to teach the truth to the people. And they should teach the full truth to the people. And so, you know, it says here, you know, if, if you understand these things, you haven't taught them. And so you need to go to those who have the authority of God, those who have revelation from God to teach the full truth. And we have testified over and over again that that full truth and that authority of the holy priesthood is found within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and among no other church upon this earth at this time. And if you will humble yourselves, if you will seek the guidance of the living prophets, seers, and revelators, you'll be greatly blessed and you'll receive those things, those principles of the gospel that will lead to your eternal salvation with your ability to return to live with God once you depart this life. And not only that, but the, the promise is joy and happiness in this life. And that joy and happiness surpasses all understanding. So marvelous to have that. If you walk close to the Spirit of the Lord, that Spirit you feel in your life, it, 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 nothing is comparable to that joy that you feel uh, in this uh, earth. A lot of people seek after things they think will bring them joy, and it might bring them moment, uh, momentarily uh, pleasure for a moment. But it is not an enduring love. It is not an enduring spirit. It is not an enduring peace that you can feel with you every day of your life as you walk in the commandments of the Lord. Uh, let's look now at uh, 27 through 37. Ye have not applied your hearts to understanding. Therefore ye have not been wise. Therefore, what teach you these people? What are you teaching these people after all if you're not teaching them the truth? You know, what do they do? They teach flattery. They try to get people to like them, popular things, so they can get lots of followers. And from all their followers, they can get lots of money from them and, and take their money so that they can live in mansions and fly in private jets and have all these worldly possessions. And they said, We teach the law of Moses. And again he saith unto them, If ye teach the law of Moses, why do ye not keep it? Uh, why do ye set your hearts upon riches? Why do you commit whoredoms and spend your strength with harlots, yea, and cause this people to commit sin? That the Lord has caused to send me to prophesy against this people, yea, even a great evil against this people. And know ye not that I speak the truth? Yea, ye know that I speak the truth. And ye ought to tremble before God, because ye know that you're wicked, and that in your wickedness you cannot be saved. And it shall come to pass that, Ye are smitten for your iniquities, for ye have said that ye teach the law of Moses. And what know ye concerning the law of Moses? And then they have a discussion here about whether the law of Moses brings one into salvation. And he comes down here, he says in verse 37, Now, bid I send it to them, have ye done all this? You know, have ye, have ye kept the Ten Commandments? I say unto you, Nay, ye have not. 
And have ye taught this people that they should do all these things? I say unto you, Nay, ye have not. Now we go to uh, chapter 13, and we'll look at verse 3 through 4. And at this point, they're really angry, uh, King uh, Noah and the priests, and they want to kill uh, Abinadi. And he says, Touch me not. He's full of boldness here, with the power and spirit of God. Touch me not, he said. For God shall smite you if you lay your hands upon me. For I have not delivered the message which the Lord sent me to deliver. Neither have I told you that which you requested that I should tell. Therefore, God will not suffer that I should be destroyed at this time. In verse 4, But I must fulfill the commandments wherewith God has commanded me. And because I have told you the truth, you are angry with me. And again, because I have spoken the word of God, you have judged me that I am mad. In verse 5, And now it came to pass after Abendai had spoken these words, that the people of the king Noah durst not lay their hands on him. They felt the Spirit of God with him when he commanded him not to touch him. They felt the power of God. They knew if they touched him, they would be destroyed by God immediately. Therefore, they were terrified. They were terrified of him. And these words that the people of King Noah durst not lay their hands on him, for the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and his face shone with exceeding luster. Even as Moses did while in Mount Sinai, while speaking with the Lord, his whole face was shining because he was so full of the Spirit of God. And he spake with power and authority from God. And he continued his words. And he says, uh, You see that you have not power to slay me. Therefore I will finish my message. Yea, and I perceive that it cuts you to your hearts because I tell you the truth concerning your iniquities. Remember 1 Nephi 16 too. The wicked taketh the truth to be hard and it cutteth them to their very uh, hearts or to the very, very center of their being. Yea, and my words fill you with wonder and amazement and with anger. And then here in uh, verse 10, uh, but now he goes over the Ten Commandments with him about not committing adultery, not stealing, not killing, not bearing false witness, not coveting your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife, and, and all of these things. So then he says in verse 25, And it came to pass that after Abinadi made an end of these sayings, that he said unto them, Have ye taught this people that they should observe to do all these things for to keep these commandments? I say unto you, Nay. For if ye had, the Lord would not have caused me to come forth and to prophesy evil concerning this people. The very reason I had to come prophesy and be commanded by God to come prophesy to you because you're not teaching the people, you're not fulfilling your obligations uh, to God to teach the people the truth. He says here in... Um, and then they go here about the uh, Law of Moses and how the Law of Moses was designed for a wicked uh, people to bring them in constant remembrance of God. Remember, there's 613 commandments. All the many commandments, roughly 300 of the things that they need to do each day to keep the commandments, as well as the th the prohibitions of the law. So constantly had to be thinking of 613 different commandments in order to not sin, in order not to offend God. You know, and, and so that was all designed. To keep them remembrance of God, but to point them to the Savior, even Jesus Christ, because He'd be the fulfillment of this law, of Moses. And so He says here in verse um, 32 to 35, and now that they understand the law, the ancient Jewish people, I say unto you, nay, they did not understand the law. And this because of the hardness of their hearts. For they understood not that they could be any men saved, except it were through the redemption of God. For behold, did not Moses prophesy unto them concerning the coming of the Messiah, and that God should redeem his people? Yea, and even all the prophets have ever prophesied since the world began. Have they not spoken more or less concerning these things? They all taught of Jesus Christ. We know that these, a lot of these teachings did not make it into the Bible as we have them now because as First Nephi talked about the great and abominable, the great and abominable church cut these precious and plain truths from the Bible so that the people would err and, and not know the truth. Have they not said that God himself should come down among the children of men and take upon him the form of man, and go forth in mighty power upon the face of the earth. Yea, have they not said also that he should bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, and that he himself should be oppressed and afflicted? And so now we move here to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, uh, the quote here in uh, Mosiah chapter 14. 
Yea, even doth not Isaiah say, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So when Christ was on the earth, he looked like a man. He looked normal. There was nothing spectacular about him that, that signaled just based on his outer appearance that this was some mighty man upon the earth. What was powerful about Christ was with the power of the spirit that people would feel as he spoke uh, to them and to their hearts. And through that power of the spirit, they came to accept Jesus as their Messiah. He is despised and rejected of man. Many men, the wicked, rejected him. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Remember, as they, they captured Jesus, the twelve apostles all flee, all flee and flee, you know, get out of there, out of, out of there. And Peter later tries to come, but he's scared too, and you know ends up, you know, the, the, the King James version talks about how he denied Christ. You know, he, he, he denied knowing who Jesus was and that he was one of his disciples and these things. But they had all fled uh, uh, for, from, from Jesus at this point. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Smitten of God. Uh, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, as Numbers, I believe Numbers 21.17 uh, teaches. So when Christ was uh, put on the cross... They thought he was cursed by God because that's what the Old Testament had taught him. The Law of Moses taught him that anyone that cur was hung on a tree was cursed by God. So here he, Isaiah prophesying, and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we were healed. They beat him with, you know, you know, with a whip. They put the crown of thorns in his, into his head. You know, they, they beat him and smacked him around. All we like sheep have gone astray. They all departed from him. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. That Jesus died for our sins. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Remember, he's brought before the uh, before the, the the Roman ruler, and you know, and uh, Pilate says, "Don't you you know understand that I can release you?" And Jesus opened not his mouth; he did not speak a word to him. Uh, he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and his sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison; he was put in prison during the night, and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. Remember he died between two thieves who were probably guilty of, of you know, of, of the punishment, punishment of, you know, by death from the cross. Died between two thieves. And with the rich in his death, Joseph of Arimathea, a ruler of the Jews, a member of this Jewish Sanhedrin, gave his own tomb to Christ to be buried in. He says here, um, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no evil, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Joseph knew he was an innocent man and, and not guilty. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. Through his redemption, through his atonement, we become the spiritual sons and daughters of Christ. So he sees his seed through, through us, the faithful uh, members of the church. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. Therefore, while I divide him a portion with the great, he, God gave him his right hand seat. With, and he shall divide the, great, the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many. And made intercession for the transgressors. So that was a great, powerful prophesy. How many prophecies were fulfilled here in Isaiah 53? And Isaiah gave this a good 700 years before Christ was to even be born on the earth. So now in chapter 15, now, uh, Abinadi is now going to explain to uh, these uh, priests and to King Noah uh, the teachings here of Isaiah. And uh, now we'll look at 10 through 14. He says here, and now I say unto you, who shall declare his generation? And this is what we kind of talked about already. 
Behold, I say unto you that when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And now what see? And who shall be his seed? Verse uh, 11 here. He says, uh, Behold, I say unto you that whosoever has heard the words of the prophets, yea, all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord, I say unto you that all those who have hearkened unto their words and believed that the Lord would redeem his people and have looked forward to that day for remission of their sins, I say unto you that they are his seed and they are the heirs of the kingdom of God. For these are they whose sins he has borne, they who are they for whom he has died, to redeem them from their transgressions. And now are they not his seed? Yea, and not, not the prophets, every one who has opened his mouth to prophesy, that has not fallen into transgression. I mean, all the holy prophets ever since the world began. I say to you that they are his seed. And these are they who have published peace, who have brought good tidings of good, who have published salvation, and saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. They are the seed of Christ through his redemption and his atonement. Now we'll look at 20 through 23. We're in chapter 15, 20 to 23. But behold, the bands of death shall be broken, and the sun reigneth, and hath power over the dead. Therefore he bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead. Because Christ died and rose from the dead, all of us will be able to raise from the dead as well because of Christ. And there cometh a resurrection, even a first resurrection. Yea, even a resurrection of those that have been, and who are, and who shall be, even unto the resurrection of Christ, for so shall he be called. And now the resurrection of all the prophets, and all those that have believed in their words, or all those that have kept the commands of God, shall come forth in the first resurrection. Therefore they are the first resurrection. And they are raised to dwell with God, who has redeemed them. Thus they have eternal life through Christ, who has broken the bands of death. And they, these are they who are, are those who have part in the first resurrection. And these are they that have died before Christ came in their ignorance, not having salvation declared unto them. Those who lived according to their conscience and did good according to their conscience, but did not hear of Christ, will have the opportunity provided to them in the spirit world while they wait the resurrection from the dead to embrace the gospel. And then the, the modern and then saints of God will be baptized in the holy temples on their behalf, so that they can accept the ordinances of baptism and the laying on of hands for the receipt of the Holy Ghost, and they can receive the uh, uh, temple blessings. So because of, of that, and what a great God and glorious God that we have that He gives them the opportunity for those who did not have the opportunity here on earth to receive that opportunity to become baptized members of his church and baptized by those having the authority of God. And in verse 25, and what a great verse of scripture this is. And little children also have eternal life. Yet there are churches upon the earth who teach that children, if they don't get baptized, are going to be damned and go to hell. That's not a teaching of God. Jesus in the New Testament loved the little children. He said, he said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. So we know that little children will be saved if they die before, before the age of accountability, which is the age of eight. Uh, they will be saved in the, the celestial kingdom of God. And now in uh, verse 26 or 27, it says, But behold and fear and tremble before God. For he ought to tremble, for the Lord redeemeth none such that rebel against him and die in their sins. So if you rebel against God, you better hurry and repent of your sins, because if you die in your sins, you, you have no such redemption. Yea, even all those that have perished in their sins ever since the world began, that have willfully rebelled against God, that have known the commandments of God, it would not keep them. These are they who have no part in the first resurrection. So if you knew the commands of God and you did not do them and you die in your sins, you will not have part of the first resurrection. Therefore are ye not to tremble? For salvation cometh to none such, for the Lord hath redeemed none such. Yea, neither can the Lord redeem such, for he cannot deny himself, for he cannot deny justice when it has its claim. Even God has to abide by the law of justice. And, uh, you know, unless you repent of your sins, there is this divine law of justice. Even if God wants you to return to him, he, he, he's powerless to, to save you from this divine law of justice. According to divine law of justice, you don't repent, you're going to be damned. I mean, it's, it's, no, it's, it's so clear. But if those of you will repent of your sins, 
and come back to the Lord Jesus Christ, accept Him as your Savior in your life, you can be saved. Okay, so that then ends chapter 15. And Okay, so now we move to chapter 16. And, um, and so now we read here in chapter 16, verse 1 through 2. It says, And now it came to pass that after Abinadi had spoken these words, he stretched forth his hand and said, This time shall come when all shall see the salvation of the Lord, when every nation, kindred, tongue, and people shall see eye to eye, and shall confess before God that his judgments are just. And then shall the wicked be cast out, and they shall have caused to howl and weep and wail and gnash their teeth. And this because they would not hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore the Lord redeemeth them not. So because of the resurrection and the atonement of Jesus Christ, we're all brought back to God's presence temporarily to be judged according to our sins. And, uh, and we're going to all, all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people will confess that God's judgments are just. And therefore, when the wicked are cast out after acknowledging that God's judgments are just and acknowledging that they had had a chance to accept the gospel, to keep the commands, but they refused to do so. And that therefore, they know they're being justly punished for their sins. Then, because of that, that's when they're going to be wailing and weeping and, and howling and, and gnashing their teeth because they would not hearken unto the voice of the Lord. And therefore, the Lord redeemed them not. And so now we look here in verse 5. But remember that he that persists in his own carnal nature and goes on in the ways of sin and rebellion against God remaineth in his fallen state and the devil hath all power over him. Therefore he is as though there was no redemption made being an enemy to God and is also the enemy uh, and also the devil is an enemy to God. Now if Christ had not come into the world speaking of things to come as though they had already come there could have been no redemption. And if Christ had not risen from the dead, or not broken the bands of death, that the grave should have no victory, and that death should have no sting, there could have been no resurrection. And Christ had to be the first fruits of them that sleep, as, as Paul taught in the New Testament. And because he rose from the dead, we were all raised from the dead as well. He, in verse 9, He is the light and life of the world, yea, a light that is endless, that can never be darkened, yea, and also life which is endless, that there can be no more death. And he says here in uh, verse 10, Even this mortal shall put on immortality, and this corruption shall put on incorruption, and shall be brought to stand before the bar of God, to be judged of him according to their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. And the reward, if you're good, if they be good, to the resurrection of endless life and happiness, the ability to live forever and to be happy as you live forever. And if they be evil, to the resurrection of endless damnation, because... They're going to still live too forever and ever. That's a gift of Jesus Christ through the resurrection. They will live forever and ever. But this endless damnation being delivered up to the devil has subjected him, which is damnation. Because why? They had gone according to their own carnal wills and desires, having never called upon the Lord while his arms of mercy were extended towards them. He always extends his arms of mercy towards us. We just have to allow him to embrace us. I'm sorry, I just lost my place here. We'll go back here in uh, 16. He says, uh, Towards them, and they would not. They being warned of their iniquities, and yet they still would not depart from them. And they were commanded to repent, and yet they would not repent. In verse 13, And now are ye not to tremble and repent of your sins? Remember that only in and through Christ can ye be saved. There is no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved except through the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 15, Teach them that redemption cometh through Christ the Lord. Okay, so now in 17, now they're very furious now. The priests want to, uh, and Noah wants to kill Abinadi. But because he spoke boldly, as it said earlier, because he spoke through the power of the Spirit, the Spirit convicted those guilty ones of their sins. He also changed Alma's heart. Alma is one of these priests. And Alma feels this change. He feels the spirit touch him. And he wants to change his life completely around. And he's going to become a great mighty prophet and bring many to the knowledge of the truth. And he tries to now plead for the life of Abinadi and ask the king to save Abinadi. So the king gets mad at Alma now and wants to kill Alma also. So Alma has to escape and hide for multiple days. But 
he was so touched by the Spirit that he was able to remember the words of Abinadi to record them. And that's how we ended up with this great discourse, this great sermon that Abinadi gave was because of Alma. And uh, so that, that's what Alma does now. And in verse 16, they're now starting to burn uh, Abinadi to death. And he says, And it will come to pass, that ye shall be afflicted with all manner of diseases because of your iniquities. So the question is, and especially at a time like this with COVID-19, the coronavirus on the earth, is does God allow people to be afflicted with diseases? Well, it says right here in the scriptures, and it will come to pass that ye shall be afflicted with all manner of diseases because of your iniquities. Therefore, when God pours out these these uh, diseases or illnesses, it's important that we all repent and help each other to repent, to turn to God, that God perhaps then may lift this uh, disease from the earth, that he will may bless us with healing and heal our lands, as it says in the Old Testament. If we will return back to him, he will heal, us of our, uh, he'll, he will heal the land. He says here in... Uh, and that they're going to be smitten and they'll be uh, uh, driven as a wild flock is driven. He says in verse 19, another great scripture here. Thus God ex executeth vengeance upon those that destroy his people. He will not, he allows them sometimes temporarily to be destroying his people. But eventually God will take, he says here, execute vengeance upon those that destroy his people. It says, uh, and then when Abinadi had said that, O oh God, receive my soul. And now when Abinadi had said these words, he fell, having suffered death by fire, he having been put to death because he would not deny the commandments of God, having sealed the truth of his words by his death. And what a bold and mighty prophet this Abinadi was. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what would this world, what this world would be like if if we were all Abinadi's, if we all spoke boldly in God's name, all kept His commandments, and all taught our neighbors to repent of their sins and come unto God? We would have a glorious uh, world full of people who love and serve each other and keep God's commandments. We would have great peace on the land. We would all be happy, joyful people. And so what a great lesson, uh, all these things. And I testify of the truth of these things, that through Jesus Christ and Him alone can we all be saved from, from hell and, the, and death and the grave. And we can all return to live with Him in His presence with this endless happiness, as it keeps talking about in the Book of Mormon. You know, a lot of us here on, in the earth go through periods of misery and through suffering and great trials. But how would you like to be happy all the time for the rest of your life, having, knowing that you had overcome the trials and the obstacles that had been put in your life because you were faithful to Jesus Christ and you kept his commandments and you continued to follow him until the day of your death. And I testify that these blessings are real, that they are the promises of God for us at this time in our life. And I testify that this book is the book of God, the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ, together with the Bible, are two witnesses of Jesus Christ, and that Jesus is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings upon the earth and in the heavens. And I testify of these things. I testify that Joseph Smith was the prophet of God, who was foreordained with a very important mission by God, and before he even came into the world, that he would be the prophet to bring to us and translate the Book of Mormon to bring forth the uh, knowledge of the ancient prophets who lived in America so that we have the ancient uh, knowledge from the prophets in the Americas and the Book of Mormon and the ancient prophets in the Old World uh, through the Bible. And so what great blessings we have. You don't want to be only a half Christian and only have the Bible. You want to be a full Christian and have the full truth of God. And that's what Joseph Smith did. And he also brought forth the Book of the Doctrine and Covenants, which are revelations given by God to him in the 1800s, a modern day revelation to us. And we'll be looking at that next year. That's going to be a great uh, 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 year also as we continue to feast upon the words of Jesus Christ to continue to increase our testimonies and continue to increase our faith in him and I testify that he will bless you with these things if you will now not only continue to read them and feel his spirit manifest the truth of these things to you but if you go forward and keep these commandments then you become you know, draw nearer to God than by any other book of scripture as the prophet had taught us in his day and I testify of these things I love all of you 
Thank you for spending your time reading and studying the Word of God. Until next time, this is Dr. D. Todd Harrison signing off.